Hello and welcome to The Thing About Golf, the Golf Australia magazine project that explores the myriad reasons otherwise sensible and intelligent people get hooked on this crazy game. My name's Rod Murray, and as regular listeners will know, I'm your guide on these journeys into the psyche of golfers, that group of people for whom the game has become more than a game and is instead a part of their very being. It's no great surprise that professional golfers are overrepresented in this group. After all, the truth is that to pursue golf for a living, you really do need to be just a little bit odd. As Matthew Goggin once famously said, talent is merely the entry fee in professional golf, and after that it comes down to hard work, self-belief, dogged determination, and yes, even a little bit of luck. Our guest on episode 22 is guilty as charged on all the above counts, but in Peter Fowler's case, we can add one more characteristic to the list. It's a less common one in professional golf, or indeed any elite pursuit, but the enduring impression one gets from Chook is humility. He's an Australian Open champion, a World Cup winner, and a dominant force on the European Senior Tour. But to talk to him, you wouldn't know any of that, because at his core, Peter Fowler is simply a good bloke who happens to be good at golf. As always on The Thing About Golf, our chat is a lengthy and wide-ranging one, but there's much wisdom to be gained by listening to Fowler, and I hope that this is one you'll stick with to the end. Well, Peter Fowler, the first thing we have to say, as always, is thanks for taking the time. It's a bit of a commitment doing the uh, Thing About Golf podcast. Let's start right there. It is our jumping off point for the podcast. Finish this sentence for me. The Thing About Golf is... Oh, it's a great way to meet people, travel the world, and, um, you know, to... It keeps you fit as well. <laughs> well, funny you should say that. I'm going to be rude now and ask you just how old you are because you look amazing. I'm looking at you on the camera here. We're chatting on Skype. You're in New Zealand, of course, the Stay Shore Tour. We know it's been cancelled for the year. I'll ask you about that in a moment. But you look amazing. You might be the only person I know who has got fitter and fitter and fif- fitter after the age of 50. Oh, it helps when you're not very fit to start. <laughs> Set the bar low. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I'd love to wind the clock clock back uh, to when I was 20 and um, and uh, have a have a proper go at the at the, at the golf tour but um, yeah I had a lot of fun along the way you youth wasted on the young is this what we're saying Pete <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that's right it's sort of uh, after after a few years you know I play with all the top players but never reached their, um, their you know the levels of Greg Norman or Seve Ballesteros but uh when I think back, they were they were ahead of the game. They knew they knew they were better and they were fitter and stronger and better techniques, and and they had that self belief. And uh, I think you know, getting fitter and working at your game, it uh, it certainly gives you the self belief that you can um, compete. What's the most important there? I think a lot of us get sidetracked and think it's just the physical. Is it the being fitter or the self belief that made Norman and Ballesteros better than everybody else? Oh, I think they were skill. They were very, very skillful. But uh, you know, certainly in Greg Norman's, um, he he was fitter and stronger. He hit the ball. He was the longest hitter on the tour. He um, he could demolish some golf courses. He was a uh, he was a great driver of the golf ball. So that that set him up every time. You know, where I used to see where he's hitting his shots from, especially around Huntingdale at the uh, at the Masters in the, in Melbourne. You know, he he just killed us off the tee and um, it's no surprise he won so many of them. What was it like playing with the Shark at the peak of Shark Mania? We had probably a decade and a half here in Australia where golf was Greg Norman and Greg Norman was golf. You were right there through all of that. What was that like and how often did you get the chance to play with him and what were those experiences like? I imagine they're some of your fondest and diff- most difficult memories in some way. So, so far ahead of the field was he sometimes. Yeah, well, you know, like he was he was the best, you know, he was so good for Australian golf, you know. I think looking back, I think we probably took it for granted what mm-hmm. he did for Australian golf. Um, whenever he pl- he played a lot of tournaments in Australia, he didn't have to. Mm-hmm. He's the number one player in the world and he could have commanded a lot a lot of money overseas and so for him to come and play the Australian, it really made the Australian tour and and, uh, and kept us on the map and kept our prize money high. I think whenever he played, we played for double the prize money that we were playing for when he wasn't playing. So, um, 
you know, if Greg, if you ever hear this, uh, <laughs> thanks very much for that. <laughs> but um, you know, he was he was intimidating to play with. You know, like I said, he hit the ball further, he hit the ball better. He was stronger. He had a he had a he had a good charisma for on the golf course. And uh, the one thing I always remember when you play with um, you know Greg or, or the best players in the world, as soon as they part out on one green, the crowd leaves. So <laughs> the only thing to keep the crowd interested and in, in waiting for you to play is that you got to <laughs> you got to compete with them and um so you know i play i, I always lifted my game when i played with uh, greg norman and tiger woods and and jack nicholas and because you wanted to you wanted to be able to the crowd to actually stay and watch you as well so um so I, again i th- i thank i thank greg and those guys for making me lift my game and uh and, and staying with them as long as I could. We hear players say that, Pete, that you know, when you play with the best. Um, Bob Shearer told us on this very podcast early on in its life uh, last year when he was drawn with Jack Nicholas at the Australian Open the year he won it in 1982. He went on to, to beat Nicholas. When he was drawn with him on Thursday and Friday, Bob, who's a bit of a larrikin, thought to himself, well, I better behave this week. I've got to play proper golf, be a proper professional because I'm playing with Jack. What is that, and how how do you manage to lift when you play with a Norman or a Nicholas or a Tiger, and why can't you just do that all the time? Why can't you do that when you play on Thursday with Mike Clayton? Yeah, well, that's uh, that's right. I think um, when you look at all those top players, you know, be it Jack Nicholas, um, Lee Trevino, Tom Watson, Chevy Ballesteros, especially, and, and, and also Tiger Woods, is whether they got paid or not. They always wanted to win. They wanted to perform. They wanted to be. They wanted to definitely wanted to win. You know, they didn't care how they how they won, as long as they won. And uh, I remember Seve Ballesteros. Someone asked him, he said, "Which is your favourite tournament?" He said, "Oh, well, the Lancome Trophy." And they said, "Well, why why the Lancome Trophy?" He said, "Well, there's no cut." You know, so <laughs> Seve was back when people made a big deal of guys getting appearance money. Seve was, he, I think he felt like he was under pressure to perform when he was mm-hmm. getting the big appearance money. Mm-hmm. You know, nothing like Tiger Woods was getting these days, but um, big for our, for our time. And uh, I think because they're always lifted, they're, they're the number one players mm-hmm. in the world. People expect them to perform. So they're under a lot of pressure, more than, uh, you know, more pressure than we sort of give them credit for. You know, we, we just think it's normal for them, but it's, uh, I think they, they lifted. They wanted to perform. You know, certainly um, Seve, he was a great performer. Uh, and Norman as well, you know, he didn't want to come second. Um, so they, they finished in the top ten a lot. They won a lot of tournaments. I think Greg and Seve won 90 apiece. Nicholas won, he must have won 100 or, or more than 100 around the world. And uh, Tiger's um, doing the same. So, you know, it's... When they're left in the game, you've got to you've got to stay with them. Yeah. Do those players bring a different energy, Pete? I've been in the same room as Norman a couple of times, and he has a presence. It's almost physical. It's not, but you can almost feel it. It's you almost feel like you could touch it. There's an energy that seems to come out of him. I haven't had that same experience with others because I haven't been in the room with Tiger or Nicholas in that way. Is that perhaps what it is? And does that rub off on you when you play in the same group? Can you feel that that they almost bristle, don't they? Like a racehorse before a race. There's a there's a nervous sort of a shimmer going on in them. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, definitely, definitely, Greg. You know, he was mm. he, he was intimidating to play with. So you you had to play really well. Mm. You know, like I remember when I played with Greg, I teed the ball up and I hit it as hard <laughs> as I could, and I, I I really tried to stay positive. You know, because you you can't yeah. hide. Um, uh-huh. And the same when I, I played with um, Tiger in two thousand and three in Germany, and I remember in the last round, and I remember. Getting the um, the tea times, you know, and I, I wasn't playing very well, you know. I sort of, I was about, I was running about thirtieth, but that was um, that was a lot of scrambling to get there. And you know, Tiger obviously wasn't playing that good; he was thirtieth as well. So anyway, we were playing together. But I knew Steve Williams, but Steve is a, an intimidating very, caddy, very much so. Great caddy for for a guy like Norman and Tiger Woods, because you know he's not going to just say what they want to hear, you know, he'll give them his opinion. But anyway, I, I got the draw and I, I couldn't sleep all night. And I was thinking, <laughs> oh, you know, I'm, I'm not playing very well. This is going to be embarrassing. 
it's in a two ball and everything. So I remember I think we're off about eleven thirty. Um, so anyway, I got I got to the course at seven o'clock in the morning. I thought I'd better find my game <laughs> and sort it out before um, before Tiger. And, and it was after I, I'd only just had my card back for three years after having three years off when I had no game at all, and I was still struggling. You know, I was I, I, back in two thousand when I had after the three years off, I, I felt like a rookie for the very first time. I had to, and I was still looking for my game in two thousand and three. So, you know, I found something that I was so nervous, it was unbelievable. And at the time, I had the yips with with uh, with, with my driver off the tee or, <laughs> and, and most of the clubs in the bag. So I, I remember, I had to, and especially playing with Tiger, I, after practicing for three or four hours in the morning, I teed up in the first, I said, come, Pete, just when it's your turn, just tee it up, take one look and give it a, give it a swipe down the fairway. And um, I remember I, I hit it just next to the fairway bunker and Tiger actually hit his tee shot in the fairway bunker. And I said, okay, this, I had about a, I think I had a wedge or a nine iron. I said, okay, one look and hit it. And I hit it to about a foot. So that uh, close enough that I didn't get nervous on, on the putt. But Tiger hit his to a foot as well. So we both 30 the first. And then the second was par three out of the water and I, he had a five iron onto the green about 20 foot away, and that was nerve wracking. Anyway, I rolled my putt in for a two. And uh, and then the third was a the Tiger made a par, and then the third was a par five, and I got it up near the green, up and down it for another birdie. So I started with three birdies. That's uh, That kept the crowd interested. And I had a German friend of mine catting for me from Hamburg. So he was a, he was a superstar with all his mates, you know, catting in the same group as Tiger. But uh, we, had, we had a good day, and I thought, he beat me 68 to 69, but at least I performed. But I, I lifted my game, and I, I probably wouldn't have lifted um, without playing playing him. So, um, you know, it was a good good fun day. The young Peter Fowler, uh, well, we remember you winning the Australian Open. We remember it particularly because you had that amazing albatross, Kingston Heath, what a place to win. Uh, the Australian Open, what a title. What do you recall about that? And what was the impact of that on you? How old were you at the time? I can't recall how long you'd been a professional for. And what was the impact of that for you in the couple of years that followed? I was uh, I was 24, which is which is young to win a big tournament like mm-hmm. that. I, not so much these days because, you know, Tiger's done it, Aaron Badley's mm-hmm. done it, and the players are better younger mm-hmm. these days. They've got better techniques, mm-hmm. you know, they're – I think they're fitter because of the different academies that the states mm-hmm. and the, the national um, teams are running. So they're much more prepared now than when when we did it. We just we literally dig it out of dug it out of the mm-hmm. dirt. I never saw my swing on video until I was in my twenties. So you know, biomechanics and all that, and, and in the gym, that was that was um, ridiculous. I think you know, like when I was growing up, half the guys said. Yeah, you've got to go to the gym, but I don't know what to do. So, and then the other half, and the other half said, "No, don't go to the gym; it'll ruin your golf." Yeah. <laughs> so, so we just we just played and practiced. So I think you know, like Mike Harwood, Peter Senior, myself, Wayne Grady. You know, we played for, for certainly five or six years. We probably played forty more, at least forty tournaments a year, mm-hmm. um, which is a lot of golf. But and, and we just we were just getting the job done, you know, and uh, and that was so. You know, over over time, you've got to. But then I and I had a good career up until the sort of the mid nineties, and then I, then I just lost it. I don't know whether the brain gets tired, or cert- certainly the body uh, was hurting a bit in different things. So I think uh, you know I've been on the tour for nearly twenty, or been a pro for nearly twenty years. So I played a lot of golf, and anyway. Um, Lost my game, so I had to rebuild my game completely, uh, technically, and I, I didn't start to get better, and I didn't start to make progress until I, I admitted to myself that I was rubbish, and I start again, started from the basics, and so I have the benefit to know that I could take my game apart, rebuild it, and then get back onto the tour um, at the tour school, European tour school, in the end of '99, and. Uh, Played for ten more years in Europe. Not not always great, but uh, at least I was trying. And then, uh, 
And then the year, the day I turned 50, I hurt my back and um, I trip, played for, for a couple of months, but I was uh, I was rubbish really. And I had to go, come home and I needed back surgery because I had the discs um, snapped off and, uh, and stuck on my nerve. So I had to rebuild physically in 2009, uh, the year I was 50. So I didn't really start my senior career until I was 51. And then... Um, then I drove the ball better than I've ever driven in my life for the next couple of years. Um, and I, I, so I think physically and technically I know I can rebuild. A lot of guys never get to that stage, so they don't know what, what they can experience. You know, I see a lot of guys giving the game away now without either losing it technically or physically. Um, and, I, you know, if I had a message for for the, a lot of the young players or younger players or that, They've got a lot left in the tank, more than they think. How can you play for that long, Pete, and have the success that you've had and then tell yourself in 2000 that you're rubbish? It can't be true, can it? You don't win an Australian Open if you're rubbish. You don't win a European Tour event if you're rubbish. You don't win a World Cup with Wayne Grady and win the individual title if you're rubbish. You're being a bit harsh on yourself there, aren't you? Oh, no, I wasn't rubbish then. No, definitely. Uh, I had some, had some great um, finishes. But a great short game, you know my mm-hmm. my putting, my putt, my short putting was rock solid, and I chipped it very close. You know, I had, I had a lot of tournaments where I'd, I you know, make twenty three out of twenty four up and downs for the week. Wow! And um, but then one thing uh, people don't realise is the golf courses change. You know, like because back in my prime, you know, I only hit the ball two hundred and fifty yards. And uh, we were playing older golf courses, you know, Royal Melbourne, where you just got to position it. Um, but Royal Melbourne is such a great golf course, even though it's not hugely, you know, much longer than it was in in our that my my best golf. It's still um, it's still a um, positional golf course. When the greens are in tournament condition and tournament firm, firmness, you've got to be in the right place, hitting the right shot. And um, so it's a skillful golf course. But um, a lot of the golf courses built, certainly, um, you know, from the from the 90s onwards in Europe, and where, which is where they play most of the European Tour events, they're all, you know, brand new golf courses. They're built on old farms. So the ball doesn't bounce like it like it does on the links mm-hmm. and everything. And um, in Europe, they get a lot of rain. So it, it's all carry. And they're big, long golf courses, and um, you know, great for guys like Greg Norman who drive the ball, Magic, and uh, and a lot of the young players. So, so when I got my card back in the year two thousand, I just remember for ten years I teed the ball up as high as I could, hit the damn thing as hard as I could. Otherwise, you know, otherwise I, I couldn't compete mm-hmm. on the golf courses at all. And if you didn't have a driver off the tee, some some par fours, especially in Ireland where it's windy and and wet, I couldn't reach the green. I think that the modern golf courses have bred the long hitters as well. Mm-hmm. They've they've grown up knowing they've got to smash it a mile, and that's um you know it's not about position and about hitting it as far as you can and and attacking the pin. And everything about the game has been built around helping players achieve that, hasn't it? We've seen the equipment, the fitness regimes, the understanding of the golf swing, the biomechanics, as you said. It's all designed to promote the longest hitting of the ball possible. What's your take on distance? There is a raving, raging distance debate, which no doubt you've got some thoughts on. What What is your take on yeah, the so, current state of play? Yeah, well, c- certainly I think that the, yeah, the golf courses demand you play a certain way. Um the ball doesn't run much on the uh, on the modern golf courses, especially in Europe. Um, it's not as hot in Europe as well. So the golf courses, you know, if you get a seven and a half thousand yard golf course in Europe, it plays much longer than it does in the states, mm-hmm. um, because it's you know you know you, you barely see on the American PGA Tour anybody playing with a sweater on, mm-hmm. but in Europe, you know, you, <laughs> you've got a sweater and sometimes a rain suit on. And and um, and the you know it's it's cool the wet temperatures are cooler the ball doesn't go as fast so you got it at a country mile and uh, yeah the fitness things um, certainly helps the guys hit a long way and, and then technology as well the ball's much more stable 
than it used to be, you know, the tour bladder. We, you know, I started off playing a small ball, then we went to the big ball, and and um, and the ball spun a lot, the ballada ball. So I spent I spent ten ten years trying to hit the thing low enough to to stop it spinning, and now and now I can't get it off the ground. You know, I'm trying <laughs> to get the ball in the air. Yeah. You, you, and and so the guys hit it much higher, and so they can carry it more. You know, I think and and. Uh, because we were, we were just sort of drawing and fading and hitting one irons off the tee or three irons or five woods or three woods, well, we weren't smashing it as hard. Well, I wasn't. You know, Greg Norman was. That's mm-hmm. why he was so good. You know, he was he was he went after it. But um, and I think these days the guys are getting conditioned to hitting it hard all the time, and that's uh, that's what helped. I think playing from 2000 to 2009, before the seniors tour for me in Europe, hitting it as hard as I can, I think that enabled me to to play much better as a senior golfer because all the guys that I'd played with that used to outdrive me by 30, 40 yards, like Ian Worsden and Barry Lane and these guys, I was able to – now I was level with them. Hmm. And um, that gave me a lot personal – a lot of confidence. Um, <laughs> Something's never changed, do they, Pete? As a teenager, all you want to do is hit it past the bloke you're playing with. And after yeah. 40 years in the game and playing professionally, all you want to do is hit it past the bloke you're playing with. It's crazy. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and a lot of the, my guys that I, we played, and you know, we're all about hitting about the same distance, you know, Mike Clayton, Mike, Mike Harwood, and um, and the other guys is, um, and now I was out, I'm out driving them by 30 yards. So, so you know, I can compare. I can compete, and, and on the seniors too, our courses aren't quite as long. We're only playing at probably seven thousand yards, um, which is longer than when I started playing, mm-hmm. but um, but not not the beasts that they play with on the main tour. Uh, uh, and no wonder you're smiling. You're hitting at past blokes, which is always a, a, a nice thing. I guess the ultimate question, Pete, and you've played right through it, is the if if we accept professional golf is really just entertainment. And for the most part, it is. I think there's some important things for those of us who love the game that it's more than just entertainment, some of the bigger events and some of the history of the game. But if we accept it's just entertainment, is it more interesting the way it's played now compared to when we were younger men? There's an obvious bias uh, in there that we'll have because we're a certain age on it. But if you look at it objectively, is the game more entertaining now than it was in 1983 when you won the Australian Open at Kingston Heath? Um, well, it was certainly more entertaining when you're watching Greg Norman and Seve Ballesteros and Tom Watson and Jack Nicklaus at their prime. That was that was entertaining. Mm-hmm. You know, I think Tiger's entertaining I in his prime that, too. So is Rory. In fairness, yeah, exactly. Oh, you know, I love what I love watching them play. That's why I watch the golf as well. <laughs> I saw it on the TV um, yeah, when you flip the camera around. Here. Like here he is, all these years he's watching golf. You must drive your wife mad. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've done that for you. <laughs> You've uh, mastered that. Yes, no need to practice that yeah. anymore. But uh, you know, you know, things are things are changing. There's a lot more for people to watch on the TV these days. You know, there's. You know, thousands of channels, uh, lots of sport, lots of – so, the, you know, the, the tours are trying to find more interesting ways. But, you know, like golf is golf for, for, for a golfer, mm-hmm. um, you know. So we can only we can only play the best golf we can, you know, and the, and the longer hitters obviously draw a lot more crowds, you know. Who, want, who else wants doesn't want to see uh, Dustin Johnson or um, – you know, Fickle, Phil Mickelson or Tiger Woods smashing it out there 350 yards. You know, like, you know, I dream of doing that one day too. I'm still, I'm still working. <laughs> You're still on working it. at it. That's right. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm using this, the, these, this six months off we're probably going to have from the golf tours to, to rebuild my game and see if I can get my body fit enough that I can keep going for another couple of years on, on the tour and, and, and enjoy my golf. So uh, I'm, I'm working hard on, Trying to, um, you know, play better, entertain more people, and you know, I need to do it further as well. Yeah. What is the update on the Stacia tour? Just quickly, I think they've cancelled twenty twenty. Have they the whole season? Yeah, they've, they've cancelled twenty twenty. Yeah. I think there's two. 
the trouble with uh, there's too much international travel yeah, on right. playing the European tour, and I guess they don't, you know, like guys on the seniors tours. It's a uh, it's oh, target the the COVID nineteen's uh, a bit harsher on us than it is on the younger players. So I think it's just it was in the too hard basket. I think. I think the extra costs in was difficult, and most of our tournaments now revolve around having two pro ams preceding the tournament. And some of a lot of our tournaments now are pro am events, like um, you know, the, like the tournament they play at Pebble Beach or the Dunhill Lynx Trophy, where the pro am events. So you know, the, if we can't have the pro the amateurs playing with us, um, it's tough to, for us to raise the prize money as well. So. It's just too difficult at the moment. Yeah, with quarantining and all those other things is, uh, yeah, no. Yeah, no, that's exactly right, and you'll probably come out firing by the sound of it. Let's go to the other end of the game, and you mentioned it. You you survived for a long time on an amazing short game, and I know I've asked you about this before, but people might not realise. Semi Ballesteros often came to you for short game practice and fun. You played a lot of chipping and pitching games around the practice greens of Europe over the years. Tell us about that that relationship and and about your short game and how you developed a short game because unusually you're a golfer from Sydney and Sydney being predominantly Kaikuyu, we tend to see less of the short game wizardry from those who grow up under those conditions. As a youngster, there's it's a more one-dimensional game around the greens. It tends to be just because of the nature of the grasses. There's a lot less bounce and run. It's a lot more played in there. So tell us how you developed that short game and tell us some of your memories of some of those times with Seve, uh, who used to seek you out, which – should make you a guru that people kneel before <laughs> worldwide and ask for your opinions on things. Thank you. Well, well, first of all, I, I grew up in Sydney. Um, everybody that knows Sydney golf courses, there's, there's rarely a golf course that's got a practice range mm-hmm. or practice fairway. Uh, and the, the course where I was just where I was assistant pro was um, Pennant Hills. Mm-hmm. And they didn't have any, they didn't have any practice range at all. We had practice tees, which were on the sides of holes, two or three holes, and and you had to hit balls um, when the members were playing. So you'd wait for them to play through, and then you'd hit it, 10 balls, and you wait for the next group to come through. But what it did have was it had three at a putting green and two chipping greens. So while I was waiting for a caddy job or um, – or after school or before before work and that I used to go down to the greens and I'd chip and with the other caddies. We'd we we'd we'd sort of gamble a little gamble our cat gamble our caddy wages on uh, chipping around the greens and um so and 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 the pro I worked for, we had a very good short game. Me and Alexander is a great putter. Well 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 known by you know Kel Nagel and Bill Dunk as been a great putter. With well, an old hickory agree. thing that he used for about 50 years, didn't he, that same putter? Yeah, the hickory hickory <laughs> shaft. It had so much binding on it, you know, wrapped up with string after it sort of cracked a few times, but he was a magician with that. And uh, so he wasn't a long hitter, so he had a great short game. And um, But anyway, I, and I remember just playing, playing around Sydney because, again, there's no practice green, so I practice ranges. So, you know, I'd go to play trainee tournaments and you basically warmed up by hitting a few chips and putts and then you went and played. So it wasn't much, uh, many long, long shots. Um, certainly nowhere to hit drivers, you know, um, practice. So it's a big difference to these days, you know, and the, the fantastic ranges they've got in, in Asia and China and mm-hmm. the Middle East and, and, and America. You know, I just marvel at the practice facilities around the world, and uh, you know. And now I'm living in Auckland, and Auckland's like Sydney. There's no, there's no practice <laughs> ranges, or, or, or if there is a practice range now, they've got um, rock hard balls, so it's not very good to yep. to hit your long shots anyway. Um, but what what happened was when I um, if I struggled, I didn't hit, I didn't hit, um, I didn't drive the ball very well. Didn't hit a lot of green, so I needed my short game. And I improved my short game, but I, after the round, if there was some shots I couldn't play, like I couldn't play the flop shot for, for many years, then I'd go to this practice green and I'd recreate the shot and I'd stay there until I did it. And it took me 10 years to hit the flop shot properly. Um, 
I would go to, I would ask different guys, and I'd, I'd watch Seve. Certainly in Europe, Europe uh, was 1983 was my first year in Europe before I won the Australian Open. I think think that really helped. They didn't have much many um, practice ranges in Europe either, so and you had to pick up your own balls. But I, I always played well where they had good short game facilities, you know, good putting greens and good chipping greens, and and um, of course when you're at the chipping green, um, you know, Seve was great around the greens because that, but that's because he practiced it as well. You know, he grew up as a, as a caddy in the north of Spain. Um, his course didn't have a real practice fairway either, so he he he, he chipped and putted around uh, around the putting greens and that, and around the course um, late in the evenings. So you know, I, I would watch him a lot, but didn't, I didn't ask him much. Uh, and still, after we played a few times, but uh, it was great watching him. He was watch, and he he would help the other Spanish players, and he loved that time in the. Uh, in the evenings, just practicing quietly by himself and with the other Spanish players, so I'd, I was watching. And um, and after we played a few times, and it, I remember occasionally he would say, "Played on the six. How did you do that thing when you did when you hit that shot? You know, have, try to work out how you thought of playing it, how you visualised the shot, and and what you did." And he said, "Oh yeah," I, and he he would say, "Well, I play it like this, but I really like the way you played it." So. You know, he wasn't too proud. He he, he was it was great to play with. Always sort of looking to learn. How does that? What does that do for you, particularly as a young player in the first few years on the European tour? Here's Seve. He's talking to you about the short game. The whole world wants to know about Seve's short game. He's asking about yours. That must give you a boost of confidence. Yeah, well, you know, it's just, it's just the odd shot, you know. Like, and and I would ask, I would ask him about, you know, that shot you played on the um, such and such a hole. You know, how did you play that? You know, like and. He loved it because he grew up as a caddy, mm-hmm. just chipping and putting. Yeah. You know, um, I, I play with, I actually played with him in 1979 at the Australian Open at Metropolitan. My father was caddying for me, and I played with Seve, and I was, and uh, I think it was the third round, and uh, you know he was he would just won the British Open that year at Lytham. So I was, you know, I was a bit intimidated, and it was my first year on the tour. So I was, and I was struggling the first few holes, and after about six holes, he came over. He said, "Don't worry, just keep, just keep trying, just keep trying." You know, he's only two or three years older than yeah, I, was... I was at the time, but he, he was a superstar already. And you know, the, the encouragement. You know, he gave the encouragement, and you know, I think you know, I've always sort of um, looked up to him, and well, I've looked up to all those superstars. You know, whether they, whether I was friendly with them or not. You know, they're. They're, um, they're, they had an amazing game. You know, I only wanted to get as close to them as I could. You touched on something there, Pete. You mentioned your start in the game. You started as a caddy. You were born at Hornsby, as was I. So we share something. Uh, I'm shocking at yeah. golf and you used to be. So we share another thing. That's where it's, <laughs> it it parts ways. But you started caddying at uh, Pennant Hills. That doesn't happen anymore. Could it happen again in this modern world? Would that be a good thing? Quite a few of our players of your era started that way. Mike Clayton started as a caddy. I know that. It wasn't unheard of. I think Jeff Ogilvy is probably probably the last of our well-known professional players who caddied as a youngster. We've lost something there, haven't we? Yeah, well, I I think so. I had great great fun caddying, you know, like in the times change, though, but, uh, you know, where was I going to earn a couple of bucks, you know, and... um, Caddying was a, was a great place to do that, um, and I think I learned a lot about how to p- just play the game because I was watching either the I, ca- I I was fortunate enough to caddy for the the pro at Pennant Hills, whatever I could, or the assistant pros during the week when they when they finished work and they played nine holes. Myself and a couple of buddies, the other caddies, we we caddied for the assistant pros, and uh, they let us hit a couple of shots and that, so it was good. But even just caddying for the members, you know, le- learning about the competitions and, um, you know, the stable foot or the match play and this and that. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of the members weren't very good. They were asking us, how, you know, what do I need to do with my tripping or putting? And so we, uh, as we got better, we were helping them with their games and, um, you know, we were pulling two bags at once and, and stuff like that. I, I, I look back on it, it was fantastic. And, and, um, and also looking for golf balls, you know, after school, I'd go down and look yeah. for golf balls. And then I, then I had a 
a bag of balls I could go and practice with. So they were great times, and that uh, you know, I think I think the younger kids would probably learn a bit more about golf before they started. But you know, they're starting so young now. You know, they just want to play themselves. Yeah, indeed. If I'm not mistaken, it was your path into golf. I don't think you had family members who played, did you? You didn't have a dad or uncles who played. That was your path to yeah. golf. Was you started? Right. You wanted to earn some money, and here we are. 40-something years later, um, and it's been your life. That's it. Yeah, no, my, my father did play, but he was a cricketer, and he only ever played about a dozen times a year in, in the winter, really, after the cricket season mm-hmm. had finished. Um, but he won the B grade championship. He won the seniors championship at Penneth Hills. So he's a decent – but I, I, I caddied for him one day, and then uh, – and then not long after that, my, my brother and his mate started playing, you know, when they, they were in high school. And I went, just before I started high school, I went and played with my brother and his mates. And um, and then we started caddying at Bennett Hills when I was 12 years old. So that's how I got into golf. And then I, by, by caddying, we all started playing. And my father, very early on, he got me, you know, bought me six lessons with Ian Alexander, the local pro. and and they're the only six lessons I've ever paid for with Ian Alexander, the old, old school. And he taught me, uh, you know, I'd go to the junior clinics. He ran in the school holidays. But I, like I said, I caddied for him. So I learned he was, he'd give you tips or you just watch. When you're watching good players like that, you you learn the, the rhythm of the game and how to play shots and all that sort of stuff. So, um, but that's how I got into golf. And uh, But my father, he... He didn't interfere very much with my golf. He was smart enough to let Dean Alexander take care of my game, and uh, and uh, and leave it at that. He was a great he was a great supporter and great follower. He came to all the golf tournaments, watched every day. Um, so he was a, he was a great sport watcher, and uh, you know we I watch uh, all my kids. Uh, you know whenever I was at home, which it wasn't very often, um, you know I was watch them play netball and tennis and cricket and stuff like that. So. Um, so I had a good upbringing. My dad, you know, being a, you know, a talented cricketer, he knew how to pl- practice cricket, and uh, and sort of, I guess, he passed it on to me, and I practiced golf well. You knew enough about sport to not get involved <laughs> with one that he didn't understand. Not in, not interfere. Yeah, yeah you know, yeah, he indeed. very, very quick, very quickly. I was, uh, I was sort of, I was decent. And he just eat, eat him. My, my mum and dad, they just took me all over Sydney when I could, so I could play golf. Yeah. Because I was never, I was never a member of the golf course in Sydney. Ever? I had a, no, I had a, I had a single fare handi- handicap at uh, Coffs Harbour and where we went on holiday. And um, so I just went around Sydney playing um, stroke competitions every weekend. Wow. Or schoolboy competitions. Yeah. That all. That's so no, no club golf for me, you know. Quite extraordinary. I was extraordinary. just a stroke player. I want to come back to some of that first, but I, I want to give you the chance. I met Ian a couple of times, Ian Alexander. Yeah. Old school gentleman, pro's pro is how I would describe him. What a delightfully calm demeanour. And I think you've already said, I think your only coach for your whole career, and I even a few years ago I saw him out following you at a seniors event, I think at Kalara, still taking an interest and, and having a say. What a, what, what a role model and what a mentor for you. Oh no, he is. He, he, he is definitely a gentleman. Uh, probably one of the benefits is he didn't drink. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, I'd go to you know after we played at Penavilles, we'd go to the clubhouse. We'd have a cup, you know, we'd have a have a bit of lemon mm-hmm. or, or a lemon squash and, and and a cup of tea. So he didn't. So he didn't sort of take me to the dark side <laughs> in my early days. And I think that really helped me. So I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I didn't drink much in the early days. In fact, it's quite yeah. dangerous, isn't it, for many, many, many a talented young golfer has stopped their their path in golf at that 18, 19, 20 years old, isn't it, when they well, – probably not just golf, but the drink is a is a real danger, isn't it, for young players? Well, that's right. You know, I remember some of the guys, he's, you know, their, their pro had finished work at 5 o'clock. He said, I'll lock up and I'll see you, I'll see you upstairs for a beer. So instead of practicing for a couple of hours, they're in the clubhouse drinking for a couple of hours. So I think I, I got very lucky like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, Ian, Ian was, um, and I think they've lost that 
old time pro, which I, I think the members, you know, it, it's tough to get those that that era back. You know, there was Dave Mercer, there was Alex Mercer, there was Bruce Jackson at Concord, there was those guys, and I I still play with them three, you know, two or three times a week when I'm in Sydney, and I, I still use them. I, I I have a lot of other coaches around the world when you're traveling a lot, <laughs> and um, some of them have really helped me with technology and and, and mm-hmm. taught me how to drive the ball better by using TrackMan and all that sort of stuff. But I always see Ian because he can always get me to play well. Uh-huh. Other guys can get me to swing well, and um, and get me fitter in that. But Ian Alexander, he can get me to play well, and it's just he knows me. He knows you know how I work and. He can fire me up too if he's if he he can get pretty honest <laughs> if, if he thinks my game's in 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 poor shape and that and I'm not working hard enough. So. It's important, isn't it? It is, yeah. You know, like uh, you know, sometimes in my early days I didn't take it so well when he when he told me I wasn't working hard enough. <laughs> I did more talking on the practice range than than practice, but then he he knew how to fire me up, and then uh-huh. you know a month later I was back playing well again. Yeah, you're probably not the most physically naturally gifted golfer and yet you have ground out a really quite remarkable career is there any way to try to calculate the importance of attitude versus aptitude there'd be many more players that you would have encountered along the way that you would have thought amazing player i wish i had his skill i wish i had his talent i wish i had his whatever and many of those players won't be playing golf anymore and yet you still are playing on the scene so we're getting ready to go back and dominate in 2021 when COVID-19. What's that, the importance of that attitude and aptitude? Yeah, I guess that, um, you know, I was a decent cricket. I was a decent uh, uh, goalkeeper in soccer. Um, but golf allowed me that I could practice by myself. With those sports, I, I loved playing. I didn't practice. Mm-hmm. It was tough practicing. Um yeah, and I, I saw a lot of super, what I thought was super players in Europe and Australia and New Zealand, and, and, and a lot of them, you know, some of them didn't even get their tour cards on the mm-hmm. on the main tours, and I was, I was surprised. You know, they were good enough to win tournaments in Australia occasionally, uh, a lot of pro-ams, but, you know, I was surprised. But I guess uh, <clears throat> Ian Alexander said to me early on when I worked for him, he said, "If you want it, you do it yourself." And when when I was assistant pro, I worked my fifty five hours a week for forty eight dollars my first year. And uh, a lot of people would say that can't be right, but, <laughs> but I did. But I, but it was the best time of my life. Mm-hmm. I loved it. And Ian, a lot of the other assistant pros got a couple of hours off to practice during the day. And Ian Alexander said, "He said, oh, he said, if you don't practice in your own time." meaning before work or after work, he said, you're not going to practice in my time. So, you know, the, so that made me practice for a couple of hours before work. And if Ian saw me working hard in my own time, he'd say, okay, well, you can go out and play the comp today with the members on the Wednesday or the Sunday. We can go and have a putt for a, an hour. Um, and he said, if you want it, you've got to do it yourself. No one else is going to do it for you. You can't blame anyone. He said, if you want a lesson, you ask me for a lesson. You know, I'm not going to push it on you. So, you know, so it was so it was self-driven. And, mm-hmm. and I remember when I started on the tour, Ian, you know, I finished working, my, did my apprenticeship for Ian for three years and was out, out on the tour. He would have preferred that I worked a few months each year in the in the shop just to get some money. And um, But anyway, I, I was too... Uh, I was ready to get out. And <laughs> you were young. You knew everything, Pete. <laughs> do my own thing. He said. He said. Listen, if you're struggling, I've got some money to help you. But try and do it yourself because you'll gain the self belief knowing that you've done it yourself, and that will really help you in the difficult times. And I never knew. I didn't have to ask you in for any money. I did it all myself. You know, young players should, over the last few years. You know, they've asked me, "How did you get your sponsors?" When you were young, I said, didn't have any sponsors. He said, what, what do you mean you didn't have any sponsors? I didn't have any sponsors. There was none around. I said, um, 
I said, you only need a sponsor if you're not going to make any money playing golf. I intend to make money playing golf. Um, and so that, that, that's sort of how, how it was. And I guess golf was always difficult for me. I always felt, you know, I was never the best when I was younger. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I tried hard, but other guys would hit the, hit the ball further, hit the ball better, you know. So it was always hard work for me. So I guess I, you know, and I was practicing in the rain today in Auckland. <laughs> and that's the winter here. It's my fourth, fourth winter in 38 years. I don't like it. <laughs> and uh, I'm practicing in the rain. The pro says, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm, I'm building my mental toughness. There's a, tour- there's a tournament at the end of, uh, at the end of July in, in Auckland. There's a four round tournament where all the pros and the amateurs all play, and the girls all play together. So that's uh, that's going to be my next competition. And uh, I said I'm building my mental toughness by practicing in the rain. It's it's easy it's easy when things are going well uh-huh. or you're hitting the ball well to practice. It's tough when you when you're struggling. And I, I always felt like I was struggling, even even when I won the Australian Open and uh, and I played on the European Tour for 25, 30 years. He said, I always felt like I was struggling the whole time. Do you need no, that so maybe? To, do, do you need that feeling oh, to I, keep you working and playing well maybe? Is it a yeah, trick I, you play I, on yourself? It's it's funny. I talked to Mike Harwood, who's been a good mate of mine, and he, you know, he's panicking about his game and I said, well, that's good. You know, you got to panic about it when there's nothing on, because I think you know you want to, because on the seniors too, there's not a lot of money. No. Or or in Australia or New Zealand, there's not a lot of money in professional golf, so you've got to be the best. Mm-hmm. So you know that panic that Mike experiences or or I experience before the tournaments is actually good. It drives you on. You know, if that's, that's what we've got. Going for us, you know. Wayne Grady was a really hard worker. Peter Senior, incredibly hard work. All the guys that have done well in Australia and New Zealand have worked really, really hard. Yeah. And I think some of the guys are so good, naturally gifted, uh-huh. they haven't had to work as hard to get to get up there. And I think that's that help that that holds them back a little bit. It's funny, isn't it? It strikes me that Tiger Woods is probably. The perfect combination of an extraordinary talent and a work ethic. It's amazing what humans are capable of, isn't it? If they've got both, most exactly. people don't. And I, Greg Norman was the same. Now he he was physically gifted, you know, like any, but he worked so hard. I remember he, he was when he was assistant pro at Beverly Park in in Sydney for a year, working for Bill William, a mate of mine, Doug Murray from Tasmania, who was working with Greg Norman. He said. Well, you guys used to work in the range. He said, well, I worked on the range. He said, Greg Norman just hit golf balls all night. <laughs> it, was a, it, was, it was a flood-lit range there at Beverly Park in Sydney. And he said, and Greg, and I remember Bill Longmuir was at his place in Florida, and Greg Norman, he watched Greg Norman hit 300 three irons over his palm trees into the ocean there, you know, and he used to do it every day. You know, so, you know, Seve Ballester practiced so hard. Yeah. Nick Fowler, Bernard Langer, these guys are machines. You know they they don't leave anything to chance. You know Lazabal, he plays ten weeks in a row, seven days a week, and he's wow. on the he's at the golf course every day. And there's no mistake for those guys. They, but they they're doing that before they get to the you know yeah. they're not waiting until it's all over. No, no, that's exactly right. I know that. Well, you often hear the stories of Norman practicing elsewhere away from the tournament course in the early morning during tournament week so he could get his work done when he was such a superstar that he couldn't walk onto the course without being mobbed by a thousand people wanting a thousand different things. He'd go and practice for two hours at another course nearby before yeah, turning yeah, up to the he course. Was, he was there to win. He wasn't there yeah. for, for anything else. Yeah, and all the smiles and everything else are all just uh, sort of a part of that. Let's talk about some of your own golf people, but enough about other people. 20 professional wins, Wikipedia tells me. How many do you count for Peter Fowler? How many professional wins do you count? And there's a couple of there that I particularly want to talk to you about, the Australian Open one and that World Cup with Wayne Grady. But how many wins do you reckon you've got? No, I think, yeah, I think I've probably won about 10 times on the on the main tour. And, I'm, well, 
another um, another seven on the European Senior Tour, and mm-hmm. there's probably uh, I've won a lot of other small senior events mm-hmm. in uh, Australia, New Zealand, mm-hmm. but um, which you have to do it to, to yeah. make. In- I was going to say, uh, otherwise, my friend, you'll be living in a caravan because <laughs> there's not a huge amount of money to be made playing senior golf, is there? So if you if you want to no. keep playing, you've got to play well. Um, actually, just before we talk about your some of your tournaments. There was something you once told me which I was found fascinating. What you say to young players who seek your counsel about turning professional, about what the realities of that are and the numbers. Can you remember what you told me about that? Probably, you know, there's only, like in, in Australia, there's only like... Yes, this is exactly 50, what you told 50 me. 50 pay, paying jobs in Australia, you know. There's a lot more of us. There's a lot more than 50, but and in Europe there's only 100 and mm-hmm. America there's a couple of hundred. Japan, there's a hundred, and, mm-hmm. and it's slim pickings for the rest. Yeah, and so I suppose if a young player is thinking about turning professional, there's maybe a thousand people in the world making a living playing golf on any given year. That's the reality of it. The top few are doing really nicely, thank you very much. But yeah, probably not, probably not that many. But yeah, so that so, yeah, you need to keep that in mind, don't you? If you think that. Playing golf for a living is what you want to do. Mathematically, there's just not. Well, there's only, you know, there's probably four tours. There's obviously the PGA Tour. Um, then you've got the Corn Ferry Tour, which is a lot smaller. Mm-hmm. Um, European Tour and Japan Tour is probably quite good. Um, and the Asian Tour, there's enough tournaments up there now, but they're all... The Asian tournaments are sort of split with Europe mm-hmm. and and uh, and uh, a couple of them American as well. So it's sort of you know only half the the Asians, only half the field in Asia is sort of you know for the Asians, and uh, and it's usually for the Europeans or something as well. So it's it's tough. That's why a lot of our Australian golfers have gone up to Asia and done quite well. Mm-hmm. Scott Hen and uh, Terry Pilkadaris and that, but uh, you've got to. You've got to go hard and you've got to go for a while. And the reality for a lot of players on a lot of tours around the world is that it's actually costing them money to chase the dream. That's the truth, isn't it? Uh, challenge well, Tour, I think of in particular. The travel costs of just playing the Challenge Tour would be enough to put anybody off. Well, the <laughs> Challenge Tour, I got I got my card through the Challenge Tour one year. Um, but you don't you don't make any money. No. No, it's just well, a pathway, isn't it? Most – a lot of the guys – I actually get their tar- card for the European tour, you know, and because they've got young families and that, they actually can't afford to play the European tour yeah. the f- next year. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's it's really sad, but it's 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 really tough. Yeah, it's dog eat dog. And I think you you finished telling me that story by saying, but you'd never tell somebody not to have a go. No, you got to you got to have a go. I think you know you got to follow your dreams. You and I think. Okay, for me, I work hard at my game because it was always difficult and all that, and I do a lot of physical work now. But everybody's got to find their own way, you know, what works for them. And and basically, if it's not working, you got to just, you got to change it yeah. to, to what does work. And um, you know, so it's it's been a good life for me. But I I can see, you know, you you can't. Well, people used to tell me I was never going to be good enough, mm-hmm. and I've played professional golf for nearly 40 years, so or over 40, 43 years now. So, you know, I proved them wrong, but, you know, and I don't want to I don't want to tell a guy he's not good enough, you know. Actually, when I look back at it, one of, one of the guys that really impressed me, and he's not a household name, but uh, I met, I was playing a practice round with Peter O'Malley, and Peter O'Malley had a, a, a friend of his, Gavin Coles, from, um, wow. from, from Bathurst. Yeah. He said, do you, want, do you mind if Gavin plays? I said, no, no, fantastic, you see. And Gavin plays his first year on tour. He, he would have been very young. He's not a big he's not a big fella either. And I, I remember finishing the round and thinking, that, thinking, I didn't say it to anyone, but I was thinking to myself, you know, like he's kidding. He's got no game at all. <laughs> but he, and and I, I've heard him talk and he's how he, he was never any. He was going to go get his bridging school, go to the bridging school for the PGA and learn to teach. And but he he, he worked hard on his game with uh, with uh, Gary Edwin, and um, you know. And then he 
He wins five events on the the web.com or the Corn Ferry Tour as it is mm-hmm. now. Um, had his card in America, on the PGA Tour for four years. Yep. And I like, you know, I haven't seen him for many years now, but if I saw him, I'd die. I'd tell him that story and I thought he's done, done fantastically well because there's a lot of guys who had much more talent, yep. natural talent than Gavin mm-hmm. did, and they didn't do anything. They didn't have a go. They didn't. They didn't fight hard. Yeah. You, you were talking earlier about doing your 55 hours and all the practice and all the rest of it. It strikes me. We had Scott Hend. You mentioned Scott Hend. We had Scott on this show just a couple of weeks ago, and he talked about he still plays the main tours. And a lot of the young guys that he comes across, he says there's a real sense of entitlement. He'll ask them, what did you pay for your flight this week? They won't know. He says, How could you not know? This is your money. How could you not know whether it cost you 5000 or 2000 How do you not know what? paying for that it is a completely different world isn't it that's not to say that they're necessarily wrong but your dad i'm sure would be horrified at that my dad would be horrified at the notion that some 20 year old kid has no idea and doesn't care whether he paid two three or five thousand dollars for a flight he'll just sort it out at the end of the month it's a different world isn't it yeah so i remember a mate of mine at the vic open this year we're playing the biggest tournament we've got in australia Mm mm-hmm Fantastic no, event too, by the way, which you must have enjoyed, I would imagine. Yeah, fantastic event. They've done really well. Um, got the girls there playing as well. They're playing for a million and a half. We're playing for a million and a half. It's a huge effort. Um, and there was a, a young kid. He's only been pro for six months, and he's he's played four tour events. He said, oh, you know, early in the week, he says, oh, I'm, I'm over this. I need, I need a month off. <laughs> From what? <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking, I'm, and, and, and my mate's catting for him. He's going, God's sake, he said, you're kidding. Anyway, fin- nearly finished last. He's a very good player, a like, really talented player. And I'm thinking, God, this is, he hasn't got a tour card anywhere. He wants a month off, oh. you know, like, you tell, if you said that to Wayne Grady, <laughs> he, when he qualified for the US tour, Wayne Grady, the tour school in America, which he was desperate to get on the tour on the PGA Tour, the tour school was his twenty second week in a row. Wow, incredible! Isn't it? And I, I can't believe it. You know, he's playing for a million and a half dollars. You're not going to get this opportunity very, very much. You know, like, and he'll probably be a, end up being a super player. But, but well, you know, Debbie Ballesteros and Bernard Langer and Greg Norman, they'd have never done. No. They'd have never stood that. You, you can make the case, can't you, Pete? I mean, you. You can play too much to where it's not ideal for your game, particularly in the modern era where there's more money around. You don't have to do that. It makes sense to give your body a bit of a rest, and particularly about, as we've talked about, some of the changes in the game. Guys hit it at 110% every hole every week now that it is harder on the body than perhaps it used to. So you can sort of understand that. But if you don't have that basic work ethic, has anybody without a work ethic ever really made it? I can't imagine anybody's ever had enough talent to get by on just talent. Even the famous Bruce Litsky, who didn't practice and put his club away, clubs away for months on end. Yeah. He must have been doing some kind of work, mental work or something. You know, but for Bruce Litsky, probably he played he, he, he played a lot of softball with his kids. Right. So he's swinging the bat all the time. He's staying yeah. loose. Yeah. Staying really loose. I, you know, I don't, didn't, didn't know Bruce uh, very well, but uh, that – that probably had something, to, and he he was he was gifted. But we don't know what he did early in no, his career. No. When he was in college, he, did he practice a lot and play a lot? You know, like Colin Montgomery doesn't practice at all, but he plays a lot. Yeah, every other day you'll find him on a golf course. Yeah. Laura Davies the same. Doesn't he's always practice. playing. Mac, John McEnroe he, he didn't like practicing tennis, but he played a lot of tournaments. He played doubles all the time. He played there. He just loved to keep playing. Um, you got to find your own way. Um, but you know, like here's a young player that I just spoke about, and if he wants to take a month off, where's he getting get his money f- to keep him going for a month? Who's paying for that month? That's the first thing you ask yourself. Who's paying for that month off? <laughs> you know, like, I, tried to, I, had to, I had to play some senior events before the big open, so you know, like you know, I can't afford to take a week off. You know, like this, you know, like there's not going to be any any golf for me to really to speak of. You know, there's because half the events in Australia will probably be cancelled, or so, so there'll be slim pickings. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's a, you know, I think, 
a lot of the managers get in their ears and they said, "Oh, you need to take, you know, you need to take some time off and don't overdo it." But they're but they're not Adam Scott and Tiger Woods yet. No. You know, you can pick your schedule when when you've got your full time job and you're secure. You and you've played a lot of the tournaments. You can pick the ones you don't like, and you can and and you can really plan your schedule. But in that first six years as a pro, you want to play everywhere, and I and I think um, and one of the young guys, um, God, what's it? Um, Victorian Kenny won Dubai this year. Lucas Herbert. Lucas Herbert. Now, apparently, he went everywhere. Yeah. He went to Asia. He went yeah. to the tour school in Japan. He went. Here, oh, there, in Europe, yeah. and everything, and um, and he gets his he plays really well in Europe, and then he didn't have he didn't play work so well last year because I think he was overlaid. He had a manager and a physio oh. and a trainer and a golf coach all all travelling with him overdoing it. But anyway, he wins D- Dubai this year, and 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 it's great because the guys played a lot. He's earned it, has he? That, that's earning it, isn't it? He's earned it. Yeah, uh, now. He, and by winning a tournament and being having your tour card, you can start picking the tournaments you want to play. And uh, you know, you, you've got to get to that stage before you can start having a schedule like Adam Scott and Tiger Woods. Yeah, nobody starts there, do they? It's funny, you know, Peter. The Kari Webb is the episode before yours. I'm just editing that now, which is fairly late in the piece. Don't tell the boss; it should have been done last week. But. We talked about sort of major, winning majors and life-changing moments, and she said that her biggest career moment, the most important thing that ever happened to her in her career, the life-changing event, was winning her f- for the first time on the LPGA because it was three years of guaranteed access to the tour, she said, and that's life-changing. Off the back of that, you can do anything. You can build a career. You can win majors. You can do all of those other things that you dream about as a kid, but until you've got that, that's the life changer. And you're absolutely right about Lucas Herbert. He had a card in China. He played on a couple of invitations in Europe. He parlayed those into some top 10 finishes to get starts the next week. It, it, he really did earn it. And in the meantime, he zigzagged across the world playing wherever he could get a start to make some money and keep his game sharp. So, yeah, nobody nobody, nobody starts as Adam Scott, do they? <laughs> you, you, look, you look at Adam Scott and Jason Day, they've had fantastic careers, you know, and they've mm-hmm. still got – they're still going to win many tournaments to go, and they were super. They were the top mm-hmm. of the amateur ranks yeah. in Australia when they and they they went to America and they got their card. And all, Adam Scott started in Europe, mm-hmm. but it's but it took them ten years of solid playing yeah. before they really um, had a solid, you know, tournament winning career. You know, like. Uh, and they were already fantastic yeah. players. Well, it's more than just playing, isn't it? You've got to learn the craft, don't you? And this is, what, I guess, what you've done so well. You've learnt the craft of professional golf, which is you turn up Monday or Tuesday, you've got a practice round of Pro-Am, there's a tournament starts Thursday, and the goal is to be there on Sunday afternoon, as, f- as late in the day as you possibly can. And that's more than just talent, isn't it? There's a whole bunch of things going to that. Well, you know, the, the, the whole thing was that, You've got to make the cut, no matter what. You just you beg and you scrape to make the cut because then you're going to get some. You're going to get paid. Yeah. Um, and, and and when I started in Europe, we had to make the cut to get into the next tournament. And That's before, yes. before the tour. Yeah. In Australia, when I started, you had to make the cut to get into the next tournament. Uh-huh. And. Um, Something to be said for that, isn't there? I know Jack Nicholas has been critical in the past of the all exempt tour. Yes, it breeds mediocrity. He says if you're not, you're not having players who are hungry every single week, uh, and that's what brings out the best in the best players is that hunger. It, it's hard to imagine why Tiger Woods is motivated in many ways, isn't it? He's got all, he's got more money than God. Yeah, he's got all but- the adulation a human could possibly deal with anything he wants he can have and yet he still he had that back surgery and like you then just went and worked and worked and worked to get it back it's quite remarkable isn't it well you know that's you know with all the suit with all the superstars the jack nicholas the lee chavinos the tom watson's the greg normans sevi ballesteros the bernard langers they don't need to 
They didn't need to play. No. They had, they had enough money. But they wanted to win. Yeah. I want to beat wanted, you. <laughs> they, were the, they were the men, you know. They they wanted to win the tournament. It's never yeah. about the money, is it? For it it's never not about, about the money. money. Never. And um, it's, it's you know, like well, Bernard Langer's 60, 62 now. He just made the cut last <laughs> week in, yes. in America. But he's a machine. He, he always works, but he loves working at it. You know, yeah. like he stays fit and he, yeah. he eats all the right stuff. He he, he's amazing. You know, I, I, I keep asking for the use pills. <laughs> when I see him and his doctor, I say, come on, give me some yeah. use pills. <laughs> Where have you got that stuff? Give us, give us the good stuff. Well, you're, you're on a, a very similar path yourself. Well, I hope you're enjoying our chat with Chuck, and if you are, then you might also like to delve into the archives. Our previous episode with the legend that is Kari Webb is proving popular, and that's no surprise, but there is plenty more wisdom to be gained from the back catalogue. Be it course architecture with the likes of Tom Doak, Bob Harrison and publisher Paul Daly, or playing. Be it course architecture with the likes of Tom Doak, Bob Harrison or publisher Paul Daly, or playing the game at the top level with the likes of Peter Senior or Peter Lonard. The thing about golf has something for everyone. So head to golfaustralia.com.au and click the podcast tab to check them all out. Or if you're one of the cool kids, subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or Google Podcasts, and not only will the whole back catalogue be available, but will turn up in your playlist whenever we release a new episode and you won't have to do a thing. All that for the crazy low price of... Wait for it. Absolutely nothing. Yes, folks, it's free. So there really is no excuse. Now, back to Chook. I want to talk about some of your highlights. Tell me what you remember about that Australian Open in 1983. It must, I imagine it's one of the highlights of your your career. What do you remember about the week, maybe before it started and what unfolded during the week? Well, I suppose it, if I go back to 1979, my first, um, event playing in Melbourne. Melbourne, if you come from Sydney mm-hmm. and you're playing trainee tournaments, 36 holes on a Monday, and the greens haven't been cut since Friday, and they're all soft, you go to Melbourne, uh-huh. they're, all, they're all rock hard, <laughs> and 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 Bob Shearer shooting 67, I play my, I play my heart out and shoot a 75. <laughs> and uh, and it was really difficult, you know. Like it's 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 really really tough playing in, on hard, fast golf courses. It's much easier to go from hard to soft than it yes. is to go the other way around. So I remember I, I all I practiced in Melbourne at Royal Melbourne and Kingston Heath and those in the first from seventy nine to eighty three was downhill putts. As soon as I got to Melbourne, I practiced downhill putts um, and and chipping and trying to land the ball softly. And um, and bunker shots because all the bunkers are deep beside the green. Mm-hmm. Pins are cut close. You got to be able to pop them up and land them soft. And but um, but I go go to eighty three and arrive, arrive at Kingston Heath and I'd, I'd missed the cut the week before at the Victorian PGA at Warrnambool, very windy place. So I was able to get there, practice practice on the Monday morning and uh, and. The, Back in back in the early eighties, seventies, and the eighties, I think all the greenkeepers they wanted to have the firmest, fastest greens <laughs> in the world. They're all trying to outdo each other, and the golf course was rock rock hard. I remember hitting eight iron, and it was running fifty yards through the back of greens in the practice rounds. And we were very lucky on the Tuesday afternoon. We had a heavy rain for two or three hours. And that made it a bit more playable, and then the same on the Wednesday. But but the greens were still rock hard. Mm-hmm. It drains away quickly on the sand, and, and they, were, they were rock hard. And I I remember I, looking back at the scores. There was not one round in the sixties. The first two rounds. Wow. Not one, which is unheard of. Yeah. It's, you know, well, probably unheard of then, but it's, you know, it never happened ever now. Um, so that's how difficult it is, and 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 the course has changed a little. It, it's essentially the same, mm-hmm. a lot longer now, and they've length, lengthened it. But the tea tree back then and the fairways were a lot narrower than they are now. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, and the 
they've cut the tea tree away and and open it up and and the golf course is still fantastic it's uh, it's uh, definitely my emotional favorite in in Melbourne because of that victory in 1983 mm-hmm. but then um, I remember I was five under playing the last in the third round so I was leading I bogeyed the last for a 68 but that was the low round that's why only one round in the 60s the first three three days so I was I was tied for the lead, I think, with Paul Foley hit it, starting the last round. Um, and, uh, and of course, I paired the last round with Peter Senior, who's, uh, who's, who I've always thought was a fantastic player. What a competitor. Yeah. And then, and Nick, Nick Price, he just, you know, just finished second in the British Open in 82. And I thought Nick Price was going to win the tournament. Uh, Hang on a minute. Or everybody else thought that as well. (laughs) Hang on, you're in the last group. You can't go into the last group on Sunday thinking one of the other blokes is going to win. Yeah, but I, you know, but then all I had to do was concentrate on myself. Mm -hmm. Come on, have a good, do as as well as you can. And I remember I I had four birdies the first seven holes to lead by six. (laughs) So that, uh, you know where you're at. At that stage, you know, you, you see a leaderboard even if you're not looking for one. And uh, and I um, I bogeyed nine and I bogeyed 11. And then I uh, I get to the 12th hole par five, big bunker in the middle of the fairway. And I remember I just, I had to rip, you know, we don't, I hit the ball 50 yards further now than I did back then uh-huh. when, I, when I think about it. And uh there's 230 yards to carry the bunker, I, and I hit hit a low drive and it, trying to get it over the bunker, and it just carried the bunker, ran on about 40 yards, and I, I had a I had a three iron back into the green, and the pin was cut. You know, a typical Sunday pin. It um, Kings and Heath was on the front right of the green. There's a big bunkers in front and all that on the right. I had a beautiful fade with a three iron, just carried the front bunker, which you had to land it short of the green. Ran up to a foot, so I made the eagle, and that put me another put me six in front again. Um, and then both David Graham and, and Baker Finch had fantastic back nines, and um, I think I parred in from then after the twelfth and uh, to win by two over Ian Baker Finch. But I think he shot four or five under on the back nine wow. for a sixty-seven. So but David Graham and Baker Finch had. 67 and 68 on the, and I had a 69 on the Sunday. And the, but then you know my two two best mates at the time, John Clifford and um, and Mike Harwood, cheered me off the 18th green. So you know it was a, it was a yeah it was re, it was really emotional. But you know that that Australian Open, talking about opening doors, that was my first full round tournament win. But the top. It, it got me in. I finished third on the Order of Merit in Australia that year, and the top four were exempted in the European Tour. So that got me my what? start in '84 yeah. and onwards. And then I kept my card. Then they went all exempt, and then I kept my card until uh, the loss at '95. That's life changing, isn't it? That's, that's it what is. Kari took it. That's life changing. Yeah, life changing. Open doors, you know, like because you 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 know you won such a big tournament like that. In your own mind, you're elevated, which mm-hmm. and it can sometimes it can it's, mm-hmm. it's difficult to to stay up that high. Yeah. Expectations from mm-hmm. from other people and and yourself, but uh, it certainly opened doors for me and uh, I had a great life playing in Europe. Yeah, twenty four years old, back nine, six in front, hit it to a foot on twelve, make eagle. You must be hearing the cheers from up ahead for Baker Finch and Graham. Do you remember much about the emotions and? How you sort of kept a little very easy to make bogeys at a course like Kingston Heath. You don't have to do much wrong to no. leak shots. Yeah, um, but you know, yeah, heavily tea tree. Yeah. Uh, I remember Te- terrifying tree. in some ways. Hit firm fairways. It's yeah, hitting the trees on the right of sixteen. I had to chip it. I get up there and I chipped it out of the trees down the fairway to seven onto the green. I hit that to a foot, and then I uh, was in the rough on seventeen, and I. Chopped it out and I had a sand wedge to a, to a foot on seven. What a, what a one foot putts there, Pete. <laughs> Takes the pressure off, doesn't it? <laughs> just, just, just that's the length you want when, that's you're, right. when you're under pressure and you're a bit emotional. But I handle my emotions well, you know. I can, mm-hmm. 
it's a big tournament. You nope. know, it can, yes. can run away from you. But I remember I, I stayed calm yeah. and I, I handled things really well uh, under the circumstances. And, um, you know, I can look back. I, you, you can draw from those experiences in, in other events. Yeah. Oh, of course. I mean, if you can win the Australian Open, you can play anywhere, particularly, and you, you touched on it there, the fields we got at the time, and you mentioned Nick Price, and you played in 79 with Seve, and Greg was one of the best players in the world at that time, and he was generally in the Australian Open field. So the fields were stronger than what we see in this day and age often. Yeah, well, yeah, was, that's right, because the, the top players came back. You know, David Graham had, had won the, the US PGA in 79 and the US Open in 1980. So he was, he was a fabulous player. Jim Thorpe from America. There was some, you know, those... Those guys, they're used to winning. Yeah. And yeah. To, to hold them. To hold, hold them, them back. Yeah. And they can never take it away from you. No, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'm reminded of a quote that I heard not that long ago from Muhammad Ali, which was something along the lines of, I didn't win that fight that night under the bright lights. I won it in the two, 10, 15 years before on the cold, wet streets running at midnight and push ups at five o'clock in the morning. And the. The, the the bit we see as the public, the, the the Peter Fowler being cheered off the green at Kingston Heath, it's the end of something that's started and built much earlier, isn't it? Tiger Woods winning the Masters in 2019 didn't start Thursday morning. Yeah. It started well, when he was right. you know, they, six years old. And, you know, people, people, you know when, you, when you win a tournament and you get a big check and they say, not bad for four days' work. Yeah, a week's tournament. work, yeah. <laughs> four days work he said what about what about the last 20 years you know what about that what about the year i had off with back surgery or or i lost my game for three years what they don't see is you know and, and i never had like i said i never had any big sponsors so for me for most of the golf golf pros it, it's what you it's the prize money you win yep except if you're the top 20 in the world then mm-hmm. their 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 endorsements or their sponsorship is much more than their prize money but for the rest of it, it's it's mainly prize money. So, so when you lose your card, you know, I had three bad years in Europe, lost my card, and then I had three years when I was teaching. But they don't they don't see the hundred and fifty thousand a year you lose mm-hmm. each time you lose your card. What does it cost you a year on tour, Pete, to do it properly? Well, I play about thirty five weeks a year, even now, and it's at least five thousand a week. But then you've got weeks off in between, and it still costs you in the weeks off. I'm terrified just thinking about that. I would hate to be your accountant. <laughs> uh, so, so that, you know, what I said, I was talking before about Mike Harwood, you know, like we need to play well here, you know, and my game's not good enough. You yeah. know? So you panic months ahead. So you lift your game and you get your game good enough that you, you don't lose that 5000 bucks a week. Yeah. And, uh, and back in the late 90s, you know, I played the whole – Australian summer never made a cut, all that, you know, and you sort of, you know, you got wife and kids, four kids. Why didn't you quit? Hey, why didn't you? Well, surely it would have well, been easier and, in fact, in some ways probably more sensible. Well, you know, some mates of mine, my, my coach, you know, and he said, mate, it's time you got a, a job. Time you got a job, a club job and all that. And I, so I started, I started teaching. I thought my game was gone. I, I started teaching in the late 90s. Um, and I was living in, in Auckland, New Zealand, and uh, Mel Tung, who was a national coach, English guy, national coach of uh, New Zealand, he taught Stephen Scarhill and Michael Campbell and, mm-hmm. and those guys, and uh, he, he got me to help him with the national squad teaching the short game, and he taught the long game, and I was trying to help teach him as much as I knew and about playing the tour and all that sort of stuff so he could pass it on to the to the younger kids in New Zealand, did some coaching in Victoria um, for the state squad there, and uh, and I was teaching, and I was I, w- I was teaching six months a year, and I was also trying to play the Australian too, because you know, sort of, Mel Tung was helping with m- with my game, and he, and he says even if you asked him now, he said, yeah, I, he said when I think back about those times, he said, I've never he- I've never seen anybody hit it. To play as badly as you were, he said. But if you were willing to stand on the practice fairway all day, then I was willing to help you. So he helped me. So I'd, I'd go down there every couple of months, see Mel Tung, and 
work on my game and uh, then I'd come back. I, but I, they, were, they were difficult times, but then, and it's funny, as the slide indoors, like I was, I got my card in Asia. I remember Stephen Scarhill, one of the top Kiwis at the time. He finished fifth on the tour school. I finished sixth in Asian tour school. And I remember after he said, he was sitting down, well done, and he said, you know, how did you finish sixth? I've never seen anybody play as badly as you did in the practice round. And I said, I don't know, you know, just dug it out, you know, dug it around, you know, like where there's a will, there's a way, you know, like sort of. And, uh, and I remember I was playing the Asian tour in 90. In the middle of 99, playing a few events up there. And I rang up the BMW International Open. My mate of mine runs a tournament in Munich, which I'd won in 93. Yeah. And I said, listen, um, would BMW pay half my flight from Singapore? Because I'm going to be in Singapore, you know, months before the, or, you know, in a month's time before the tournament. Would they, you know, would they pay half my flight so I can come and play the tournament one more time? He said, sure they would. They said, yeah, get your ticket and we'll fix you up. So I, they gave me half the, they gave me a hotel room for the week, which they do past winners. And uh, I remember I made the cut and I'm, I was in the bar on the Friday night. This is 90, 1999, sort of August, I think it was. And uh, Sam Torrance was there and he said, oh, how long are you open for? He said, oh, I'm just here for this week. So I'd love to play Glen Eagles, you know, in the Scottish Open next week. But, you know, like, he said, oh, my management company are running it. Let me ring him and I'll see if I can get you, get you an invite. So he rings him up and he said, yeah, you're in. So I, so, so I finished, end up finishing 30th in Munich. And, um, and then I went to Scotland. I stayed, stayed with a, an old mate of mine, a Scottish mate of mine who I'd met in my first event in, in Malaysia, in Kuala Lumpur in 1980. Wow. <laughs> and he was in the oil business, but now he was retired back living in Scotland, near Glen Eagles. So I stayed with him and I I, pl- I, I, I ended up finishing 30th in that tournament. But uh, and I Switzerland was a fo- the following week. So during, when, when I knew I was in Scotland, I rang up, I, I'd rang up Switzerland, said any chance of an invite, you know. I can come back one last time and play. Oh, they've all gone, but Sergio Garcia hadn't. He was, it was his first year on tour, I think. He hasn't committed yet, you know. Give us a call in a few days, you know. So I ring him up. No, we don't know yet. Give us a call tomorrow. Anyway, I finished thirtieth again in, uh, which is not great, but in in Scotland, but mm-hmm. it's another five thousand pounds for the BMW and the, and the Scottish. That was a lot of money when you're teaching in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of winter. Yeah, very much. Raining and the wind's howling. So, you know, playing there in the summer was great. Anyway, on the Tuesday morning, the guy in Switzerland says, you're, you're in. So I, I rustle around and get a get a flight. So I was staying at Greg Turner's place at the time. So, so I fly to Switzerland, <coughs> make the cut and finish 30th again. <laughs> now, all being, I was just going... One last time to, to Europe yeah. and play and play Munich. But here I am, I've made three cuts in a row, 15,000 pounds, which was at the time it was equivalent to 45,000 Kiwi dollars. Yeah. So, you know, take away expenses. I still. Better than teaching. <laughs> I thought, and I just, I thought, geez, I wonder if I could play the tour school. So I entered the tour school and I thought, oh, you know, I. Give it one last go, you know. Like anyway, I was sort of I, I was battling away in the south of Spain. Six rounds at the tour school. It's horrendous, isn't it? It's awful. It's the, worst, it's the worst week of your life. And, and in November, the, the weather's changed in in Spain, south of Spain. It's not hot and sunny anymore. It's cold and wet and miserable and damp. And uh, anyway, with uh, you got to finish in the top thirty, and I'm probably running 35th with nine holes to play. I shoot five under the back nine to finish 15th to get my to get my card. So two year 2000 I'm back on the tour. And like I said I was I, I, that's when I felt like a rookie. Uh-huh. I got out there and I didn't belong, you know. I, 
felt like because my game, I, I still had the, I had the heebie-jeebies in my head from all, from losing my game, mm-hmm. hitting all the bad shots. So it was difficult. But anyway, ten more. I played ten more years in Europe. Amazing. What happened to your game, Pete? Do you think looking back, any thoughts? Uh, well, I think some. Well, I think a couple of things. Technical flaws mm-hmm. in the game. You know, whether it's your, your brain gets bored or gets worn out. You know, gets fatigue. Or, and and the golf, like I said about the golf course, has changed uh-huh. from the old traditional, you know, 67, 6,800 yards. Now we're playing 7,300 yards on, on courses that don't run and you had to hit driver every hole. I guess the other career highlight when we think about you, Pete, what we always talk about with Pete Fowler is the Australian Open win and the World Cup in 89. You had sort of a couple of sort of banner seasons around that time, you and Wayne Grady. What do you remember about that week? And I'm going to ask you about something that Mike Clayton, funny you mentioned him, often tells the story of you asking Peter Thompson for some advice about yeah. and what he told you. Yeah, Tom, and how you, how you felt about it at the time. And he, uh, oh, I was probably 19 or 20, and Tom o obviously commentating with Brian Crafter and uh, great, vo- you know, great voices of Australian golf and TV. And I... I saw Peter and I said, oh, can you, I've been on TV the last couple of weeks. Have you got any advice? And I remember he looked, he sort of looked, he said, and he sort of turned to walk away and looked over his shoulder. He said, yeah, shoot lower scores. <laughs> anyway, couldn't believe it. Like with everything Tomo says, you've got to kind of decode it. And then he, he walked about five paces and I'm still standing there dumbfounded, and he turned, looked over his shoulder again, yes, yes, that's it, shit, no scores. And uh, and another another time was at um, St Andrews. I was at St Andrews on the Sunday before the British Open, back in 95, I think, or 2000, I can't remember. And I'm teeing off the 11th hole, tough little par three at St Andrews mm-hmm. after the loop. And Tomo comes walking up on the tee and I said, oh, Tomo, how do you play this hole? He said, oh, don't go anywhere near that bunker, that horrible bunker in the front. Just hit it 40 foot left of the pin and two putt because I always put the pin behind the bunker. You've probably been there and, and mm-hmm. seen it. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I whacked it up left to the 40 foot left of the pin, left of the bunker. He said, yes, that's it. And I said, Tomo, have you got any advice for the rest of the course? He said, yes, lots. <laughs> anyway, he turned to walk away He said, Play well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, so that was funny. But, um, you know. You just- what a mind, Peter Tom. What a mind and a gift. What a legacy he's left. His writings. I'm not sure how much of his stuff you've read, but I sometimes just pick up his book. There's a book of all of his newspaper articles and columns from over the years, and you just pick it up and read five or six pages and it makes you feel better about the world. He's, uh, exactly, yeah. Well, you know, geez, uh, Fantastic golfer. Yeah, genuine legend. I think he – maybe Tomo got his um, his short answers from, from Ben Hogan because he <laughs> said he played with Ben Hogan once and they played one at Oakmont or something like that in America at a US Open. And you know, Hogan never said a word to him all day and he walked off the green and he said, great course, isn't it? And he said, he said is it? And, and, and they kept walking. <laughs> That was the only said he, thing he said to Tomo, so maybe he got it from them. But well, there's a, another interesting character. They're always interesting characters, aren't they? The, the the really great golfers are always interesting characters with remarkable backstories. And Hogan's is, is yeah. Well, Hogan, you know, I think he had a difficult upbringing. And yeah. His father committed suicide and all that when he was nine years old, and you know, and he yep. was a caddy at the club, so he never he had, had to any- earn it. Fighting other kids in the caddy yard because he was the smallest kid and a scrapper. Yeah, um, scrapper. So, and I, I heard him doing an interview, and he said, and he he said with almost a tear in his eye, he said, "I worked hard every day of my yeah. life." Yeah, you probably saw the interview as well, and uh, you know, so so throughout the whole his whole career, he had this sort of you know chip on his shoulder. He had to try and. Yep. Drive the proof. Drive him on the greatness. Yeah, that's driven, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you, you strike me, Pete, that I keep coming back to this word. I've been trying to think of how I would describe you if somebody asked me. There's a great humility about you, I feel. Do you feel that? That 
you've said it, you know, you've discovered you were rubbish and you, you, you're even talking about the, your sort of wonderful victories. There's no cockiness about it. There's a, a humility, a groundedness. Is that important to you? Uh, geez, I, I would have loved to win a tournament just by 10 shots and just I drove the ball better than anyone and I just dominate them, you know, like a – but I never had that, you know, like they're always hard fought victories, you know, they're fight to the death, you know, sort of. Uh, and uh, I get, you know, I never, even even now, even playing the senior events, you know, even if it's only a two day pro am event, I, you know, geez, I'd love to be able to win the, one of these by, by 10 shots uh-huh. and, um, you know, just to really dominate. But, you know, it's not. It doesn't always work out like that. You know, yeah. So you know, so I never got carried away. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I never had big sponsorships, so I was always thinking of I, I need to. I need to make the cut. I need to keep my card. I need a job for next year. Yeah. Got to go to work. It was always, it was always about that, and yeah. um, you know, there's. I don't begrudge anybody that you know has a big sponsorship. No, no. Oh. By the private jets, you know, because. Without the the drive that they've got, they wouldn't have that either. Yeah, nobody hands that to them. We know that too, don't we? No, you know, and and uh, they someone asked Arnold Palmer, you know, like Arnold, you all the years, you know, you only won six hundred and fifty thousand on the PGA Tour, all your victories, you know, don't, you know, and here's VJ Singh winning ten million in one year, back. Back when he was beating Tiger in the, and he, he said, do you, "Do you feel how I done by?" He said, "No, nah, don't take." He said, "He said golf was said, tomorrow. VJ or any of those players might lose a game and never earn another cent." Yeah. He said, "So I don't begrudge them at all, you know." Six hundred thousand was a lot of money back in the fifties yeah. and the sixties. Yeah, and. Uh, and his company, well, his company is a, is, is a Arnold Palmer brand with a colourful umbrella. Yeah. It's still a big, one of the biggest. He's still in the top three. Top three top earners in golf every year. <laughs> there's Tiger, there's Phil, and there's Arnold. That's incredible, yeah. isn't it? You know, Greg Norman serves down the list. You know, yeah, you yeah. What a, what a, did, you, did you ever meet Palmer? Um, yeah, I did. I met him at... Uh, I met him at uh, at St Andrews at the British Open. It was probably the same one I bumped into. I think it was his last. It was his last British Open. It must have been nine. And I'm, fe- I'm teeing off eighteen, and I've pull hooked it in the practice round, and there's a crowd coming down the first. It was Arnold Palmer, <laughs> and it bounced. And I yelled four, and it, it ducked, and it bounced <laughs> over his head. Anyway, I saw it. So I walked over the Swilkin Bridge, walked over, and said, "Oh, sorry, Arnold." <laughs> He said, yeah, I told my wife we shouldn't be walking down the middle of the fairway, you know. Because <laughs> I don't think he was playing. He's just walking back to the hotel. A hell of a way to meet Arnold Palmer, uh, try and knock him out with a Pro V1. <laughs> yeah, I did meet um, Gene Sarazen. You did? Uh, at the Gene Sarazen World Open. Yeah. In uh, I can't remember where it was held, uh, Atlanta, I think. And um, he was there behind the 18th green. I said, I oh, Got to meet him, so I asked someone, and they said, "Yeah, you can come up." So I went up and sat with him while we watched a couple of groups come through and had a bit of a chat because I read a book, you know, about Gene Sarazen, mm-hmm. and uh, his real name's Eugenie Saracini. Yeah, that's right. An Italian background, mm-hmm. and uh, he changed it to Gene Sarazen because they just used to take, you know, I think the new immigrant to, to America, mm-hmm. you know, they he, he suffered quite a bit, and he was yeah, he was a little feisty. Guy as well, and um, and I remember I remember he did some, um, and I said to him, I said, oh, he, I remember he used to do some uh, exhibitions with Joe Kirkwood, trick uh, golfer, Australian golfer, yep. and he and he snapped back at me. He says, no, Joe did him with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he was doing those exhibitions because there wasn't much money in professional golf, oh. so they needed to do exhibitions. That's so right. Joe, Joe Kirkwood. I think he was a trick shot guy, wasn't he? He was indeed, and in fact, the Australian PGA Championship trophy is named after him, the Kirkwood Cup. Kirkwood uh, Cup, yeah, you're right. So it's, um, but it's, you know, like a, 
I guess having Ian Alexander as a mentor and, and, a, and as a coach, an old time mm-hmm. golf pro, and I still in on Mondays there's a few Ian and a few of the old timers they play around Sydney uh-huh. every Monday, um, and I and I play with them as well, as well whenever I can get the chance. It's good to talk to them and uh, nice to be the young bloke for a change too. But nice we to we get bloke. to a time in life where <laughs> you don't get to be the young bloke very often, so that's nice as well. Yes, yeah, so I think I've got a good affinity with um, you know the older golf bros. Mm. Because of Ian Alexander's influence, because he always talked about these, the old players, the Aussie Pickworths and the Jim mm. Ferriers and all these guys and the Joe Kirkwoods and th- that he he'd met when he was a young player. Yeah. So I was, so so it was good to good to talk to these so guys. That, those direct links to the past they they pass yeah, exactly. before I we even realise. That's you know. there's a lot of there's a lot of young Australians. They don't even know who Stevie no, Ballesteros no, is. Just. Just, well, they don't know who Billy Dunk is. I don't know who Peter Thompson is, some of them. Yeah, and uh, I think there should be a history test because all everything's been done before. Mm-hmm. They're not they're not creating golf from the start. You know, it's all been done. They could shortcut a few things by looking back at the past. Did we – were we like that when we were young? Clates is in agreement with you. Clates once famously said on one of our podcasts that if you're going to be a PGA professional, there's two things that you have to be able to do. You have to know who Peter Thompson is <laughs> and how many opens he won, and you have to be able to hit a two-iron. And if you fail either of those tests, you stop being a PGA professional. You shouldn't be allowed. Yeah, well, that's yeah, – <laughs> That's fair enough, isn't it? That's fair enough, yeah. Yeah, you've got to be able to – and I, like I don't use a three iron anymore. I haven't. I haven't for for nearly ten years uh-huh. because golf courses don't really need a three iron because you need to be able to hit it long and high, yeah. land it softly over water and that. But but I often practice with a three iron mm-hmm. because you know I think if I practice with a I've got a seven wood or a, or a nine wood sometimes. If you practice with those clubs, you end up it 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 detracts from your game. So I practice with a three iron. To learn to get the ball in the air. Yep. Make it harder in practice, then it's only going to be easier when you get the easier equipment in. I think Ricky Fowler's one who practices with a persimmon driver. I know there's a lot of the young players these days are on Instagram out playing with two or one hundreds and persimmon and blades for a bit of sport. Justin Thomas yeah. and Ricky Fowler well, did I, it the I other just, week. I, during lockdown, I built a club rack in my garage. So I got all the persimmon drivers out and I got my old, my old strata. Wow. Locked my Bruce Devlin Red Devil five wood and three wood. Now you're talking. <laughs> and, uh, and my old uh, Blade Wilsons that I used to use when I won the Australian Open with. Wow. And uh, I was looking at that and I've got an old bag that someone gave me, you know, like an old canvas bag. And I thought, yeah. so I've got the, I've got the set and the canvas bag. They're ready to go. Yeah. Amazing times, right? Those are uh, – well, I guess what I was alluding to earlier. I'm not sure. I don't think I, I've not seen you on Twitter, so you're probably not on there. But there's a guy I know from Melbourne who caddied for Clates a little bit over in Europe. Uh, he's a PGA member himself. He's been posting a whole bunch of old footage from 1980s tournaments here in Australia, and it just takes you back to the crowds, the yeah. sound of the shots, and the yep. shapes, and the you're hitting five irons into the first at Huntingdale. It's probably a three-wood wedge hole now. <laughs> We're watching Bryson DeChambeau hit it 220 yards with a six iron. And you're talking about trying to carry the bunker on the 12th at Kingston <laughs> with your driver at 230. Oh, no, you'll, isn't it? you'll pop it over there with a with a five iron just to yeah. – you know, so there's something about the game that's – because it's all relative, that stuff, isn't it? I mean, does it matter how far you hit a driver if – you hit it further than everybody else. Does it matter if the number's 350 or 280? Norman was thrilling at 280. It was exhilarating to watch and hear him hit a golf ball. No less exciting than a 350-yard tee shot, I don't think. Yeah, that's right. Like, Well, Norman was great around Huntingdale. There's the narrow stairways in the world. And if you hit it in the rough, it was just buried in the tee tree. Yeah. But he kept hitting the driver, and he was very good at it. He hit that. 14th hole there, he'd pull the driver out for the second shot and just work it around the trees and run it up onto the green and every other player in the field would just be like, what? How are you doing that? Just crazy stuff. And and and, and, and within 10 years, you had um, Tiger and 5 on, lobbing yeah. him, or 6 on and that. And yeah. Even my, my caddy back then, he, he had drive a 6 on to the 
to the sixth hole at Huntingdale. Oh, you ch- wow. And, uh, you know, like Norman was hitting woods at it, drivers off the deck, yeah. off the slope, and then my caddy's hitting the sixth iron. So, yeah, within 10 years, it really changed. I want to go back to that World Cup. I do want to ask you about that World Cup. You don't get the chance to play in a team very often. It's a two-man team, so it's not like playing rugby league or anything like that. But tell us about that experience and to have won the World Cup. It probably doesn't get – it's always felt a shame to me that the World Cup doesn't have the prestige that it should. It should be one of golf's most important events. Yeah, it should be because, you know, back in – before I won it in, in, in 89, you know, like Nicholas and Miller won it and mm-hmm. – you know, Palmer, I think Palmer's won it as well. Tomo. Thompson and Nagel. Tom Nagel. Yeah. And, but all the superstars played it back then. Yeah. And I think the, um, you know, the, the main tours, especially PJ Tour and the European Tour, got so big that it's hard to fit in the schedule and all that sort of thing. And that sort of, uh, effectively, those tours being so strong was sort of buried yeah. formed by the World Cup. And um, so it's a bit of a shame. But, um, but yeah, it was great to play with with Wayne Grady, who I knew very well, and um, and, and like you said, to play in a team event. You know, it's, uh, that was the last time I played it, but I got, but I, at least we got the win out of it. Yeah, they can't take but, that uh, one off you. Then you won the individual as well, so you must have been playing particularly well that week. Yeah, I, I, I had a good year that year. I had uh, I had nine straight top tens in Australia that year. And, God, we uh, had nine uh, tournaments. Yeah, and a nine or nine or ten tournaments, and uh, and then um, and I had nine top tens in Europe as well. So I so I finished twentieth in Europe that year, and uh, and um, must have been the top couple in Australia. Um, and uh, to get the to get the victory there was was fabulous. Do you remember anything particular about that week? Was in Spain, if I'm not mistaken. Was in the south of Spain at Los Bruces. And didn't you I beat? Think, I think back there I saw my picture on the wall, so it was quite funny. Didn't you beat a couple of Spaniards? And how did that go down with the crowd? I think Olaf and yeah, well, it was an interesting. It was an interesting week. I'll tell you about the start. We flew from Sydney. We played the PGA at Riverside Oaks. Mm-hmm. And we flew out Sunday night. We get to London, and we can't get the connecting flight out of London. On the uh, what morning it was, because uh, it was fog. London was under fog, so all the all the airports were shut for the departing uh, European flights. Um, so I said, "Oh, we'll, we'll we'll take the opportunity. We'll go back to my place and we'll stay and we'll fly we'll fly tomorrow morning, um, Tuesday morning. It would have been. We'll fly down there then, and." Um, they were still delayed. Anyway, we managed to get a flight out of Gatwick, and uh, we f- were flying down to to um, Malaga in the south of Spain. And they had to divert at a storm in in Malaga, so they diverted us to Seville, Seville, which is um, up on the top of the mountains. Um, so we arrived there, and we go, "Well, how long are we going to wait?" And they said, "Well, we don't know. You know, like the, the airport's closed at the moment." So I said, "Well, can't be that far. We'll rent a car and we'll drive down. A, we'll drive down. You know, it's probably about a. Th- we worked out it's probably about a three-hour drive, but they didn't have any maps. So anyway, we just get the the main road to Malaga, and we drove down to Malaga. And we're coming into Malaga, and there's cars up against buildings. There's snow on the side of the road. Well, what's going on here? There's rubble everywhere. So they obviously had massive floods." Anyway, we weave our way down and there's people everywhere and we get on the motorway and we go we go about three kilometres along the motorway and we've still got an, a, an hour you know, clear sailing to Los Bruces. Traffic just stops. So it's probably about seven o'clock at night now. Anyway, it stops and it's still stopped and... You know, 15 minutes, half an hour, one hour. And people started to get in the, out of their cars and go for a walk. So we walked down. We walked, we walked about a kilometre. The whole, the whole freeway's 10 feet deep. We realised that two or three people had drowned in their car. Oh, Jesus. So anyway, so we sat there for another two hours, three hours, and they eventually they started backing backing everybody off the motorway. You can imagine what that's like. 
You know, they're crazy drivers in Spain. Yeah, the best. <laughs> it's like Italy, isn't it? They're all nuts. And we're backing it off. Well, and then we, okay, well, we can't get through that way, so we'll we'll try and drive through the mountains and try to get to the course that way. This is you and Grady, I take it? Grady, yeah. yeah. So, oh, that was after we'd actually, you know, we slept in the car for a, <laughs> for a couple of hours because we couldn't go anywhere. And then they woke us up and said, no, we're backing out. Yeah. So so we went, well, we couldn't get a hotel. Everything was because everybody was in the same boat. Yeah. The whole place was locked down. So we drove around. We were in the middle of bloody nowhere. <laughs> and, we're, and, I, and then there's muddle over the road. Mud slide, so I'm out in front of the car guiding grades through the mud, you know, and eventually you, that's not going to work, so we go back and we try another route, and eventually eventually at 10 o'clock on Wednesday morning, we arrive at the, at the golf club and the car looks like it's been <laughs> the Paris to Dakar rally, <laughs> and uh, grades just throws the keys at the... At the uh, he said, mate, you take care of the car. I don't want to see it again. <laughs> so they returned the car or something anyway. But we found out that the um, the opening ceremony on the Tuesday or was rained out, cancelled. Uh-huh. The Pro-Am on the Wednesday was cancelled. Wow. Grades said, I'm going to bed, you know, like <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm shattered. So I said, Grades, I'll go and, I'll go and measure the golf course because we had to do our own yardage books. <laughs> <laughs> so I went and measured the course and found out the way to play it. So anyway, anyway, the next day was perfect weather, so we play unhindered. And I remember we we were playing with the Belgium team, and we, the Americans and the Spanish. There was I think it was uh, Mark McCumber and Paul Lazinger playing in front of us with. Uh, Jose Maria Lazabal and uh, Jose Maria Canizares. They were in front of us. Anyway, so we, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of level with, with them, both those teams after 10 holes. And the 11th is a tough par three you know, surrounded by water with about a five iron shot. So we, we, watch, we watch all them make a double bogey on it. <laughs> right, we're behind. We're behind them, <clears throat> and or bogey or double bogey, and uh, so, we, so we both knock it on there and hold it for birdie. And then the next hole is a par five where you go along the river or a creek, and then you you pitch across the creek onto the green, or, or you or you have a go with the mm-hmm. three wood. And I said to Graves, I said no, Graves. He said it's a one iron. Because we're using one irons back then. Yeah. The one iron between those two palm trees out on the other fairway. He said, "Are you sure?" I said, "Mate, trust me. The one iron straight between those two trees is much shorter." And we both hit one iron on the other fairway. Both hit six iron on the green. We both knocked it in for eagle. <laughs> so we're like six under on those two holes, and they they're like six they're, over. They're at six over, yeah. So, so we go from. We go from tired to be 10 or 12 in front. I can't remember exactly. Anyway, so we held that after I shot 66 and grade shot 68. So we had a, at least, a, I think we had a 10 shot lead. I remember we beat the Belgium team, which they, they only had club pros playing for Belgium then. So we had them by 40 shots. Oh, Jesus. After the first round. So we had a, <laughs> anyway, um, the next day was washed out. And the weather was so bad, it was so wet. I said, and when we started on the Saturday, and, and Saturday was underwater, the golf, golf course was underwater, but we managed to play. It was a fine day, but the golf course was mm-hmm. still, the fairways were, had a lot of water. And uh, I said to Graves, I said, Graves, we've got to be in front after they. He said, if they have any more rain, we're not going to play anymore. Uh huh. This, this, this is our Sunday. Yeah, this is our Sunday. It, uh, it started off quite funny. It was sort of on the first hole, um, Ken Azara's hits it on the fairway and he, he marks his ball and takes casual water. Okay, and he, the only place he could drop it 
that was free of casual water was in the rough under a tree on the left-hand side. <laughs> they, were, they were both fuming, but he'd already picked up his ball. Oh, so he can't put it back. No, and you can't put it back in water. No, he's got to take the... Take the yeah. So anyway, he, he's under the tree. He manages to punch it on the green and he makes his par anyway, but Alaswell wasn't happy. And uh, so we go all through the day and... and and Canazara's had a, had the ability to shoot. He shoot seventy in, even in tournaments. He shoot seventy six one day, and he shoot sixty two the next day. Uh-huh. Anyway, he shoots like six under the back nine. Well, he's on his way to shooting six under the back nine. So we've got about a. I think we had about a three shot lead playing the seventeenth, and I, <clears throat> I push my shot, right behind a tree. You know, I would have had to carve it around this tree to get it on the green on 17. But I'm in casual water. So I said, um, Grades, I'm in casual water. I've got to take a drop. And, and Lazabal, you know, he said, Mate, we've got to take a drop for casual water. Well, the only place that wasn't underwater was the middle of the 18th tee. <laughs> I had a, had a clear shot at the green. And the rules, rules officials there going, yeah, this, that's the only spot. You have to drop it there. And Graves said to uh, Lazabal, he said, you happy? He said, of course I'm not happy. <laughs> of course I'm not effing happy. <laughs> you know, I drop it on the green. We knock it on. Anyway, we, we, we're three in front because of a, Ken Azar has a shot of like a seven under for the round. And we're still three, three in front. And um, I shot 68 that day and I think Graves shot 60. A 69 or 70 or something. So, um, so we played well also, and and then it started raining on the Saturday night, and then it rained all Sunday morning. And they kept delaying it, delaying it, mm-hmm. delaying it. Anyway, about midday they said, "That's it, all over, done." So we, but but <laughs> we were well aware on the, you know, starting on the Saturday that. It's highly likely that was going to be the last round, and uh, anyway, we we managed to stay on top. Yeah, wow, that's some great memories. Uh, not just the, I mean, that's some fantastic golf memories of the tournament, but all the lead up to get there, and you'd have been within your right self so pulled the pin ten or twelve different times by the sound of it. I know. It, give it a minute. Did anybody not make? It? Did any of the teams not get there? Do you recall? Um, no, everybody made it there. Wow. Well, a lot of them only coming from Europe and that, oh. but we, you know, but we were the. I think we were the last to arrive, but others were still. They were delayed as well. They, yeah. A lot of them never made it to. They wouldn't have made it to the opening ceremony yeah. either. Yeah. So, um, and uh, actually, the storms were so bad. They had all the tented villages. They had trucks on the in, in in the village in the middle of the golf course, and they couldn't move them for four months. What? They could. They had a. They had half a dozen Mercedes Benzes. And, and and semi trailers in the middle of the golf course, and they just stuck there for four months. They couldn't wow. get them out. Four months. It washed all the uh, washed. They had, they had ten tennis courts beside the 18th. It washed them all away. Wow. All concrete tennis courts. Wow. Washed, washed all the bridges away. So I never. Tony, Tony I never Rosenberg was the tournament director. Who was? Tony Rosenberg. Oh right, okay, yeah, Tony, of course. It was, it was the Heineken. Um, it was the Heineken World Cup, and he he did all the golf for Heineken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Dutch, wow. Being Dutch and that, so I never knew any of that. But I knew knew that you'd won. I knew you'd played with great. I never knew any of that about. That. I remember Tony showing me all these photographs from the next four months. Yeah. After the tournament, with all the bridges of the golf course washed away. Wow. And uh, so that was it was. It was amazing, but yeah, it was great to be part of a team, and, uh, yeah. and that's you know, you know pretty much the only team I I played. I didn't play the Dunhill um, Cup, um, so, but it was great fun to be there with the grades and uh, bring the win. Yeah, indeed, fantastic times. Well, it's not over yet, obviously, for Peter Fowler. There's a million other things I'd like to ask you about, but I've just had a look at the time, and I'd better stop because we've run your laptop just about flat. <laughs> we've had a couple of cracks at the internet, so uh, I, I really must uh, let you go. You've been more than generous with your time. You've always been more than generous with your time, Peter. You're one of the game's great gentlemen, and for that, we thank you. It's been fantastic to catch up with you today. And Thanks, Rod, and we'll look forward to catching up in Sydney. Well, let's hope so, and soon. That would be, uh, that would be terrific.
Good on you, mate. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, mate. Well, what a career and what a life Peter Fowler has already had. And as he told us straight up in that interview, he's not done yet. At an age where most would be thinking retirement, Chalk is trying to figure out how to dominate the senior tour in his 60s. And you'd have to say that with his determination and track record, you wouldn't put it past him. That's it for episode 22 of the show, but I hope you've made the effort to subscribe because on episode 23, we're going to meet one of the best of Australia's current crop of players, Mark Leishman. But I'm really competitive at, at everything I do. It's probably lucky Audrey, my wife, is not competitive. Because if we if we take separate cars to dinner, I'll ask her which way she's going to go and I'll go a different way to try and beat her. That's next time on The Thing About Golf. Golf.